So uh, we're going to head over to Elizabeth Robson now. So Elizabeth is based at the, or was based at the University of Stirling, <laughs> and um, her exchange uh, host was the University of Oslo. And Elizabeth's talk is Community Participation and the New Goals of Heritage Management, Policy and Practice in Norway and Scotland. So over to you, Liz. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'll just try and share my screen. All right. Um, well, good to see you again, Ben. Last time Ben and I were in the same place we were in Oslo, which is very exciting. So um, we did manage to connect. And as he says, my exchange was um, based in my PhD research, which I completed at the University of Stirling and looking at um, Norway as, as, a, as a comparative a case study. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about the research um, that I did as part of my PhD and then uh, speak to, to the exchange. Um, so my PhD, uh, I completed it last year, it was an interdisciplinary PhD that looked at how we evaluate social values associated with historic places. So talking here about the ways in which people connect to um, historic environments and monuments and buildings um, as part of their identity, their sense of belonging, um, their understanding of place, for example. Um, and my PhD particularly looked at the methods for evaluating these kinds of uh, values. So it was looking very much at qualitative approaches um, based in um, ethnographic sort of uh, precedents, and then very participatory as far as possible, uh, participatory approaches working with different sorts of uh, community groups. Um, my PhD was a collaborative. I did it in partnership with Historic Environment Scotland. Um, and part of the... Um, formation of the project was rooted in understanding both from academic critical heritage literature and from practitioners that there was um, an, a sort of an implementation gap between intentions to reflect social and community values in heritage management and what was happening in conservation and management practices on the ground, that there was a, a disconnect between what was intended with regard to uh, management and what was actually happening. Um, and a recognition, I guess, that expert led, uh, let's say, um, in terms of professional expert led evaluations were um, in some cases unintentionally, but in some cases uh, quite actively erasing other ways of knowing and engaging with these places. And that was resulting in intentions, in some cases outright conflict, um, and also in, in community groups feeling perhaps that their, um, their values weren't recognised, weren't appreciated and weren't reflected in the environments that they were engaging with. So since completing my PhD, which involved um, seven case studies of different places around Scotland, um, there are some pictures of some of them there, they ranged from um, the Iron Age sites right through to 21st century kind of historic houses and monuments in the landscape as well. Um, since completing the PhD, I've done a number of other um, assessments for places in the UK, but I was particularly interested, given that um, we know that these issues are, uh, are not UK specific, I was particularly interested in seeing whether the findings that had emerged from my PhD uh, translated into other national contexts and if they might be useful or what we could learn from deploying them um, in, with other groups and in other national contexts. So, for that reason, I was uh, looking at Norwegian policies and practices around this kind of heritage management. Um, so yeah, why Norway? Uh, it's beautiful and it was lovely to go there, but the reason I chose Norway was because um, similarly to, to, to what we see in the Scottish context, there's been this move towards what's been termed a democratization of heritage. Um, so in both countries, we've seen um, heritage practitioners struggling to respond the tensions between established narratives and practices and changing demographics and social contexts. So where we see new forms of engagement uh, with historic environments, but also an increasing emphasis on locality, local identity and community benefit as being part of uh, the historic environment management uh, lexicon, should we say. Um, and the uh, new goals in my title was a nod to this um, new goals for Norway's cultural environment, a white paper that came out in 2020 in Norway, uh, which really emphasized three new, three new goals <laughs> um, around involvement, sustainability and diversity. 
So we see um, very similar language being used in policy documents between Scotland and uh, Norway. So for example, our place in time, which is the historic environment strategy for Scotland, talks about the fact that um, the historic environment plays a crucial part in the sustainability of communities. And then we see very similar language being used in the white paper, um, the goal around um, sustainable development, sustainability, where the cultural environment, which is the language they use, um, should contribute to sustainable development. And these are very broad and sort of undefined terms in many ways within these, these and other policy documents. They are critiqued um, by, by academics as having um, sort of perceived good, but, but, but also hidden complexity within them, which is not necessarily unpacked um, and lends to some of this um, practice challenge when it comes to actually how do we implement these things? They've been put into policy. There is um, an emphasis that means that there needs to be accountability and delivery against these, but what are we actually being asked to do and how do we do it? So I did a three month exchange. I finished at the end of June and I was hosted by the Department of Archaeology, Conservation and History at the University of Oslo. This was a new partnership. I hadn't uh, worked with a UIO before. University of Stirling didn't have an established partnership with them, but the exchange was focused on um, particularly knowledge exchange around shared interests in the contemporary significance of um, historic environment and of heritage more generally. And during the exchange, I was an active member of this slightly confusingly titled HEI, <laughs> but that stands for Heritage Experience Initiative, which is a strategic project of the university, a multidisciplinary network that pulls together academics, uh, doctoral students um, and practitioners and researchers from other organizations as well to uh, develop uh, critical research that bridges the academic and the applied spaces. So this collaborative way of working was very similar to, to my collaborative PhD, um, but also it meant that there was a framework within which um, I could engage with a, with a wide range of organizations and individuals, both through, um, through seminars, attending and, and giving seminars, through, through graduate teaching, and also through um, working groups. The Heritage Experience Initiative has a number of focused working groups um, and specific projects that it's running as well. Um, yeah, I should say there are some differences between uh, the Norwegian context and the Scottish context, particularly in terms of how it's, how it's structured institutionally. I'm going to focus more on the practical and um, some of the things that came through from engagements with uh, network members and, and conversations and activities I was involved in whilst I was in Norway that really highlighted when it comes to putting these things into practice, there are things that can be learned um, from the, the Scottish context. And there was real interest actually in hearing about the examples um, that had come through from my PhD research and what might be some of the transferable um, lessons there. So some of the common concerns that came out um, were particularly around identifying and responding to multiple community values. So um, I think this is true in a lot of processes, but it certainly, certainly seems to be a bit of a Norwegian uh, trait as well, that there was a drive towards consensus, that there was a sense that participatory processes were around identifying a, a consensual outcome. Whereas a lot of the work that I'd done around social values and these methods was really about capturing multiplicity um, and thinking about how we work dynamically with different and um, different values. And what's happening in, in practice at the, at the moment, certainly um, in, in the Scottish context, um, is that because it's difficult to capture multiplicity, we see social values either being seen as um, secondary or not being captured, seen as being too difficult to capture. So part of what my PhD research was trying to do was provide people with the tools to actually evidence some of these things in a, in a rigorous way. Another challenge and, and sort of expectation um, that people are grappling with is around expanding public participation and what that really means in terms of um, how, how the public are involved in these processes, but also um, the role of volunteerism. And there's been quite a bit of critic, uh, critique around um, how volunteerism really reflects existing social hierarchies and therefore the shared challenges that we see in Scotland and in Norway around diversifying participation in these kinds of processes. 
in the UK, there's a slightly stronger um, tradition of public participation in, um, for example, um, heritage societies and, and um, metal detecting and things like that, citizen science type initiatives. Um, but these are these are shared concerns between both countries about how to enable a broader base of public participation and, and meaningful public participation as well. And both of these things really speak to the changing role for, 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 for professionals and how we understand different forms of expertise and who is the expert uh, in the room in terms of some of these some of these values. So the image on the screen here was a workshop I ran with uh, Sean Jones at the Norwegian Institute for um, Cultural Research involving uh, practitioners, uh, people from the ministry and, um, and researchers talking through um, the toolkit that had come out of my PhD and how practically to go through assessments and hearing from them, um, their experiences and some of the kind of some of the shared um, lessons that had emerged around things like how to build trust in these processes, the sorts of time that it takes to engage in, in collaboration and where there might be potential to work together going forward. So these conversations and, and my placement sitting in an archaeology department, and I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, so this was very interesting, um, was sort of framed by broader academic conversations that are going on that do not just involve uh, academics in, in Scotland and, and Norway, but around how archaeology and an archaeological orientation to approaching sort of problems can connect contemporary experience with um, addressing present day challenges, but also visualizing alternative futures. Um, and these were questions that were addressed with students in seminars, but also in, in events that I participated in. So, um, for example, uh, in the first month that I was in Norway, the, um, the Nordic Theoretical Archaeology Group held, held a conference, so we ran a session there. And that involved speakers from Denmark and Italy and Germany, as well as the UK and, and Norway, um, exploring these questions around how do we understand the deep history of, of, of places as part of how we think about um, moving society forward in addressing contemporary challenges and planning for alternative futures. And then there was also a, a project called the Relics of Nature project, which is another international project um, that the University of Oslo is leading on, um, which brought other visiting researchers into the department whilst I was there, um, who were looking at the questions about human engagement with nature, um, how we address climate change in the high north, for example, and the loss and deterioration of heritage that is associated with some of these global changes that we see. Um, and I was working um, a little bit with a, with a colleague, so the, the picture on the left there is of a starved church, this is a 12th century uh, wooden church, um, and the warming and, and wetting, <laughs> wetter climates are really posing uh, conservation challenges for a lot of these wooden structures. Um, so I was uh, having a conversation with colleagues about the ways in which um, different conservation solutions might impact on the social values through, for example, um, restricting access to particular aspects, changing use patterns uh, around, around churches, for example. Um, the other two images on screen are both, um, one of the middle one, it's not a great photo, I apologise, but it's, um, it's actually in a, in a tram shelter in the centre of town, there was this archaeological uh, interpretation. Um, and the third kind of um, major driver, I guess, around the, the conversations I was having at the Heritage Experience Initiative was around this question of collaborative and co-created projects and interpretation. And, and both of these other images sort of speak to the, the, the largely educational drive that has been behind a lot of heritage interpretation in the past. Um, and so certainly public archaeology initiatives as well, which have really been around um, helping people to understand archaeological techniques and processes. Um, but I had some really interesting discussions when I was in Norway with colleagues um, initiating new projects um, that were looking at co-created knowledge and ways of which, for example, working with um, school children around interpretation in ways that connect uh, to their contemporary priorities and issues and understandings of their lived experience uh, in new ways to help them uh, connect with the past in ways that contribute to, to their life in the, in the present, not just as an education about the past, but as a way of thinking about how changes happen in societies in the past, for example. 
Um, and part of those conversations, um, something slightly unexpected about my, my um, exchange in a way was that um, through being in the, in the um, HEI network, I was connecting with um, colleagues who sat in different parts of the university or who were sitting in different working groups within the HEI, but who had a shared interest around this issue of collaborative methodologies. Um, so that was something where I was able, um, hopefully, to help move those conversations forward and to connect people who were interested in, in, in similar kind of methodological approaches, but perhaps not already talking. Um, so yeah, exploring how these challenges uh, were being addressed in another national context really raised new questions for me, as well as reaffirming the need for and relevance of this kind of work in other national contexts. Um, and helped have new kinds of conversations around how people are addressing and working productively with multiple forms of expertise and knowledge which um, particularly associated with historic monuments and places and I'm coming away from Norway um, having shared my research to date obviously but also with um, potential new leads and collaborations for, for projects. We've already agreed that um, students from the University of Stirling will be involved in a student conference later this year that the HEI is, is running at the University of Oslo. So that's really positive, but um, really this was um, an, an initiation of new conversations and, and new potential projects. Um, uh, but I'm very excited to see where they go, but at this stage, they're, they're still in the, in the formative um, in the formative stage and just yeah that image just to say that we did get out of Oslo occasionally <laughs> and got to climb up mountains and see beautiful parts of, of, of Norway as well um, so it wasn't all hard work but it was it was a very busy and stimulating uh, three months uh, that I spent there and um, so yeah thanks to uh, the SAGSA for helping it happen and thanks for your attention. <laughs>